Um, our next speaker is a seasoned educational leader and consultant to Fortune 500 companies. He's an entrepreneur, a passionate teacher, and he specializes in leadership, organizational behavior, and strategy. He has led a multi-million pound executive education business and built a business school from scratch. Today is Director of Executive Education here at the University of Liverpool um, and today is going to help us answer the question, what might the future of higher education institutions look like? Please welcome Professor Ulrich Finkler. Welcome everybody, good morning. When I saw the agenda, that the last agenda point yesterday was late bar. I was wondering how many would end up being here that quite pleased with the outcome. <laughs> now, how do I switch that up? Sweet. Oh. But before I get started, let me answer your first two questions. Yes, my voice is always like that, and no, I was not drunk yesterday. <laughs> You would be surprised how often I get that question, <laughs> whether I've got a cold or other things like that. Um, <coughs> May address. <coughs> you heard for today. Uh, it's a presentation I'm giving since about two years, which is built on a number of very different streams of thought. My background is uh, I'm an economist. Uh, I've worked in strategy consulting. And I'm now focused on, on leadership topics. Before I proceed, I need a calibration. Can you hear me properly? Yeah. Good. If you can't hear me, give me a sign. Okay? I always need to make sure with my voice that I really get through. But the room should, should do it. Um, well, thanks, Catherine, for the invitation uh, to present here and uh, for the nice introduction. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able uh, to answer all questions in regard to what higher education will look like, but I'm definitely going to give some inspiration to think about. Now, if we speak about megatrends, most of us might recall that when we were young, we were hearing things like, there won't be any woods left you know, because of acid rain, there will be nuclear war, we will already have cars, that are flying through the air. We will have cold fusion, so uh, and cheap energy without uh, nuclear waste, and other predictions like that. Well, Niels Bohr put it once uh, very nicely. Prediction is very difficult, especially if it is about the future. I like that statement. A little, might have had a twinkle in his eye when he, when he said it. And let's look at some of the predictions that went wrong. 1927, one of the founder, founders of Warner Brothers uh, said, who the hell wants to hear an actor talk? Um, he was actually convinced the music would be important. So it was not so much a technical question, it was more an uh, artistic question. We all know that this turned out to be very different. 1943, Thomas Watson, one of the founders of IBM said, he guesses that there is a world market for about five computers. 1949, an expert magazine called uh, Popular Mechanics said that in the future there might be computers who weigh only 1.5 tons, which was very visionary because at that time the computer was weighing about 30 tons. Um, well, we are a little bit beyond that, I guess. At least if you've got an, an apple and not a <laughs> in 1962, the Beatles were turned down by Decca recording uh, because he didn't like their sound. They said, guitar music is on the way out. Later the same year, they had their first number one song, and we know the rest of the history. 1973, Margaret Thatcher said that she might not see in her lifetime a female prime minister. Six years later, uh, she became Prime Minister. 
And she must have been, it was in a television interview, and it must have been so tough for her. So I think uh, her male colleagues were not always as friendly as it could be. Uh, I would guess uh, it was an expression of her frustration. 1977, Ken Olsen, founder of DEC, uh, said, but there's no reason why anybody would want to have a computer at home. In in. Oops. <coughs> Here we go. And in 1982, um, a board member of Philips said, why should any, anyone uh, want to meet the silver disk speaking about the CD? Well, it seems it didn't damage his career. Welcome. It seems it didn't damage his career because he uh, became later um, CEO of Philips. So then, why, why bother with mega trends? And what is it, what we are talking about? Um, well, mega trends are not the same as singular predictions. Mega trends, the first aspect is they are massive. They have a very um, networked uh, effect on a number of interlinked variables. They are not singular predictions for a certain <coughs> point. Um, and they, since they have an effect on so many things at the same time, they usually move slow. We tend to envision mega trends when we hear the word, and you might have heard it before, read it in the newspaper. We tend to envision it is this tsunami which is just rolling over us, and it's a, as an ex-consultant, I'm allowed to say this, and it's typical consultant talk to create the burning platform in their presentations, why they are so important. Um, uh, to say uh, the speed of change is ever accelerating, and well, actually it is, it can be measured, but anyhow, um, it's, uh, it's not the same as a megatrend. Mega trend has a totally different dimension. So if you read mega trend crowdsourcing, then that's rubbish. There is no mega trend crowdsourcing. <coughs> it's not a fundamental force that drives change. The difference is in mega trends, unfortunately, uh, we didn't have a laser pointer, so I'm going to use the old method. <laughs> um, prediction is singular, while megatrends inform scenarios that can lead to different futures. Now what is that good for? Well, once you start thinking in that mode, and once you understand which megatrends are the most important ones for your, your situation, your institution, your business, then you can use these driving forces of change as search mechanisms. Will everything we say today will hold true exactly like that? No. So there was just a revision of the uh, UN projection uh, for um, uh, the, um, the number of people on the planet, total population for 2050, and they ended up, instead of 9.2 billion, they ended up with 10 billion. That's quite a significant difference. Well, that's not the point. The point is, once you understand which megatrends are important for you, you can continuously, in a kind of moving target, inform your strategy, and you've got a search structure in which you can create different scenarios. And scenarios, that, uh, the scenario analysis and strategy was actually developed by Shell, um, and that's one of the reasons why they were the only oil company in the 1970s during the oil price shock, who fared relatively well. So it ties in nicely with the topic of uh, the conference. Mega trends are the driving forces behind the change <coughs> that creates uh, the opportunities, that opens up new opportunities, but that poses challenges too. Usually, when I do this session with companies, what I do is the presentation and Q&A itself is more or less like half a day. And then half a day, it's a workshop where you go in groups and you try to apply it, make it more applied. Um, 
since we don't have so much time, but much less, and uh, we want to leave some, some time for Q&A too, um, I obviously had to cut down. So I'm going to select some of the trends um, and uh, leave away some others. First thing we look at is climate change, demography, globalization, urbanization. The next convergence, the next convergence, that's what's called the move to the Pacific age. So the move that the center of economic gravity, the economic center of gravity is moving towards Asia. Um, and we've got, um, you will see later, uh, for <coughs> many centuries, uh, actually China and India constituted um, about 40 to 50 percent of the world economy were dominating powers. They changed only for about 200 years where we had Western dominance and we are moving into a direction where this is coming back to where it was. And that's exactly how the Chinese feel. So China in Chinese means Middle Kingdom. That's how they perceive themselves and that's where they want to be again. Resource scarcity, you will get some surprises here. I will speak about that. It's not really um, a, a standard mega trend that you would have in any of these lists. So if you see <coughs> any of the studies that at least I'm aware of, uh, you will not find this. I think it has to be in there uh, for a number of reasons that I would show. And finally, digitalization. Now, there are many more. Um, we've got biotechnology, nanotechnology, <coughs> conservation, um, and uh, quite a number of others that I'm not going to cover. It's already, well, I always want to do too much at the same time. Um, so I'm already squeezing too much in here in this one presentation. So we focus uh, on, on these. The problem with reality is it doesn't fit our little boxes. So reality looks more like this picture, or even more chaotic. It's interrelated, it's interacting, it's flowing into each other. That's why I'm not going to present in the boxes, but rather in a flow and relate the different elements to each other. OK, do you have questions so far? The funny thing is, all over the world. It happens in India, in China, in Nigeria, wherever you are, that always the places to the back are the fullest, and in the front they are empty. <laughs> <laughs> wherever you are in the world. It seems to be a human thing. I've got a friend, it's the only self-made millionaire that I know. He's always saying, the front row are the five million dollar places. So he's always going to sit in the front. <laughs> <laughs> now let's jump into the subject. 2006, an Idaho business owner killed a strange animal. Um, it looks like a polar bear. He actually had a license, uh, was uh, with a guide from the Inuit. They earn a substantial amount of their income through this uh, in Canada, uh, through this guided tours to hunt, and it's highly uh, clear quotas to not uh, uh, endanger the, the species. Um, and he paid $46,000 to be able to hunt a polar bear. Um, now I'm not, let's not discuss about hunting live animals or not. Uh, it's not my topic, not my hobby either. But anyhow, the point is, that the thing that he shot down, which he thought to be a polar bear, turned out to be a strange mixture that hasn't been seen before. A strange mixture because it had much longer claws, it had brown patches that usually don't occur in polar bears, the nose was formed in a very different way, its size was relatively small for a polar bear, for a grown-up polar bear, and it turned out to be a crossbreed between a grizzly and a polar bear. And that usually does not occur because they live in different regions. And what this, at first people thought this is a singular event. And then 
in 2010 another one was shot and then it became more and more. And what it showed was, what is uh, was, uh, shown in some studies starting in 2003, that we've got a continuous movement of the species towards the poles due to the change in temperature. Now I have to look up the numbers. It's six kilometers towards the pole per decade. It doesn't sound so much. Uh, imagine your garden growing five feet per year towards the pole. That's what we talk about. Um, not five feet. Let's see. Five feet a day, not per year. Five feet a day. Um, and at the same time, you can see that the species which used to, low, to live on lower levels are increasingly living on higher levels. The numbers are um, six meters, 60 meters higher per decade. So that is one of the indicators um, of the climate change. Now let's look at something you might have seen in the news, but we don't probably, not all of us are fully aware of the impact. That's Lake Orwell in California in 2011. Um, see how uh, the woods go up to the shore. And Lake Orwell is the biggest uh, water reservoir in, in, the, in California, um, and it feeds um, about 50% of Californian homes with water. That's the same lake in 2014. They've never seen a drought like this before. The problem is that by now it became pretty clear, and most studies would agree, agree on that, that the areas that are already hot are going to get hotter, and the areas that are already wet are going to get better. So while the temperatures in the wet areas increase, so we might see an increasing proportion of British wine, we will see a decreasing proportion of Californian wine. So if you want to invest your money well, buy expensive and very good Californian wine that you can put in your basement for 10 years, and it's very probable that the prices will explode from that. And if you hold shares in a Californian uh, wine winery, then uh, a vineyard estate, then it might be the time to sell it. There, there is another study that states California has now left water for one year. One of the problems in the dry areas is water comes from the rivers, it comes from the mountains where it's stored in glaciers and <coughs> snowpacks. Um, and actually, glaciers and snowpacks are the perfect balancing mechanism because they built up resources during times when water is abundant and release it during the time when it's needed, meaning when it's hot. Now the problem is that they had increasingly no snowfall and decreasing sizes of glaciers. There are estimates that the large glaciers in Montana will be entirely gone by 2035. That will massively impact how we live. We might very well see uh, a deserted California. That could happen. That is not out of the question. We don't have in place a system to react to a mega drought like this, to a large drought like this. We don't have that in place in any place in the world. This is the um, NASA analysis of a geothermical uh, measuring the water height in the ground between 2011 and 2013. One of the problems is too, a lot of the water we use comes from aquifers, so large uh, reservoirs of water in the ground. And a good portion of these aquifers are fossil waters, especially in areas that are particularly dry. And if you take out fossil water, it doesn't refill. A normal aquifier refills slowly with the diffusion of the water into the ground. 
but the fossil liquefiers do not refill. And we take out water in a much higher rate than even the normal aquifers to refill. So there are studies about um, the so-called Ogallala <coughs> aquifier, which covers six states in the US. Um, and it's down to a trickle. The same stu uh, similar studies in India, the sinking groundwater with about three feet per year. Once this is done, how do we feed the cities? And one of the challenges is too, with increasing consumption and increasing population, it's not only increasing <coughs> population, it's increasingly population is richer, so they eat more meat, they use more energy, and you need energy, <coughs> you need water to produce energy. So there's a very ma uh, intimate relationship between water and energy. And um, 2014 was the hottest year ever measured. Um, between 2000 and 2015, we had 12 of the hottest years ever measured. So if somebody would guess, yeah, these are local events, that seems not to be the case. The overall trend uh, value shows that <coughs> relatively clearly that starting in the 50s, we've got a massively, um, a massive trend of the temperatures going up. Now, temperatures of uh, 0.5 degrees doesn't sound much. The highest deviation from the temperature we have today, we had over history, was about 5 degrees. When we had 5 degrees, there were no ice, no snow, and no glaciers on the Earth, on the entire planet. That's hundreds of millions of years ago. So 0.5 degrees, and it's estimated, even if we take massive measures, to go up to at least one degree. One of the changes in that is in the context of urbanization. Urbanization happens to a large degree in port cities. Port cities like Los Angeles, Mumbai, Shanghai, that um, uh, these are thriving. Now, these port cities are very often built in deltas, meaning in flat areas. If you've got a one degree change in temperature, you might end up with 30 to 50 centimeters of uh, higher water level, uh, sea level. That doesn't sound much, but that implies that about 40% of, of Miami would be flooded by 2050. And with increasing sea temperatures, you've got in increasing um, intensity of weather-related catastrophes like storms. Um, so, uh, Munich Re, one of the biggest reinsurance companies, put together statistics about the trend value of hydrological events, so that's uh, floodings primarily, meteorological events, storms, climatological events, primarily droughts. There's a very clear trend value worldwide. And it has to do with our energy consumption <coughs> that started to explode around 1850. And the interesting thing is, at the same time, our wealth exploded with the British Industrial Revolution and the steam engine. And then some of the other nations picked it up too, as the other Western nations. And we, we use, the average Westerners uses about 30 times, 32 times more energy than a Kenyan. Mainly due to availability, but to our way of living too. Incorporated in our food, incorporated in the size of our houses, incorporated in the way we travel, the distances we travel, um, in the way we heat, and other things like that. The long-term projection this study it was until 2038. It's unfortunately that coal, that is the red area, will go up. Now coal is by far the worst, um, uh, uh, the worst greenhouse, the, the worst fossil fuel <coughs> in regard to greenhouse gases. Um, liquid fuels, primarily oil, are supposed to go up too. I would anticipate. We will see price increases here, and this will already go down. 
renewables will make a larger share, but unfortunately, it is absolutely unrealistic to believe that renewables would uh, replace within the next 30, 40, or 50 years um, uh, the fossil fuels. So we will add, we will definitely add more uh, carbon uh, dioxide into the atmosphere. Natural gas is the cleanest of the fossil fuels, um, but the resources are, uh, are limited too, and we will look at that um, in a second. I don't know whether you're aware that actually all of our energy-based, energy-producing resources, including um, uranium, are going to be depleted within the lifetime of your grandchildren or grand-grandchildren, the latest. Um, I was aware about oil. I was astonished to find um, the other values. Um, now, and our, uh, our versus P index is a, a resource, known resources in the ground, resources we are wealth, versus a production. Production meaning what do we take out of the ground, and effectively that equals largely consumption. Um, and our P index is a problematic thing because the resources change. The available resources and known resources change with new resources that we discover. And uh, obviously the production changes. It changes with more sustainable measures, which lowers it. It changes with, um, with increasing population. It changes with increasing wealth. It changes with increasing technology. And unfortunately, we will look a little bit into population development it seems very probable that the use in resources will go up massively and not go down. And um, we will see in a little bit that the estimates uh, for finding large uh, reservoirs of uh, fossil fuels um, that we haven't discovered, <coughs> discovered yet is not very realistic. But what I found astonishing is this that we are actually depleting a lot of the resources that our daily life is built on. So can you imagine a life without iron? I mean, <coughs> 72 years, that's not that far away. What do we do? What does the human race do with 9 billion people, 10 billion people without iron? Um, copper, we will see that in our lifetime, lead for batteries. So what do we do with the solar energy if we can charge it into batteries? What do we do with the electric cars that all need batteries that we think are clean? Well, they are, of course they are not clean because no energy is clean. And um, all down up to the point that it's projected that silver is going to be depleted in 14 years. Isn't that crazy? I mean, 14 years, that is nothing. Um, the problem is not so much each individual. The problem is they all combined together with quite a number of other rare earths and other uh, resources that um, are going to be depleted, that the number of alternatives uh, are decreased, our options are decreased. So up until now, if a certain resource uh, was uh, going um, uh, down to an extent that it was not economical to mine it. Um, it was replaced with a, a creative workaround, <coughs> and very often that even led to an improvement. Well, you need options to do that. If we don't have very, very far-fetched inventions like at a, uh, engineering on an atomic level, meaning I could take sand and make, uh, make a fiber out of it. Um, if we 
don't envision that. How are we going to cope with that? I wasn't aware of that before I started studying this subject in more detail. And I found these statistics very shocking. Now, what does this mean for us? What does it mean for our strategies? Well, what does it mean for leadership development? I think over, we're going to speak a little bit more about that later. I have to speed up, I can see. Um, and the key point is, I think we need a much higher level of focus on these things, as uncomfortable as they are. I think we need a much higher uh, level of attention for this. We need a much more long-range thinking. One of the challenges in the financial crisis, and one of the causes of the financial crisis, is short-term thinking. It was late 2006 that the CEO of Lehman Brothers wrote in an email uh, to uh, his staff, we have to increase our risk appetite. Um, by then, all the signs were already written on the wall. We have to increase our risk appetite. Um, I'm going to speak really quickly a little bit about digitalization. Um, I want to show you real quick a little video. This video was recorded at Coachella, which is the biggest rap festival in the US, in 2012. And who knows who Tupac is or was? About half. I will, I will solve the, the puzzle in a second. 2012. faster than what we have today. Try to imagine minds that are very used to, to be constantly connected. Constantly connected. It's only starting now. If you try to get your kid out of its bedroom, his or her bedroom, uh, to, to sit for dinner, um, it's probably changed by now. At my age, being sent to my bedroom was a punishment. <laughs> that has changed by today. Being sent to your bedroom means you can uh, engage with your friends on Skype uh, and uh, play games. And the problem is, this stuff is highly addictive. There's a study showing that 11 to 18 years old in the US are playing on average 48 hours a week games. They do not go outside. They do not move. They do not interact with others in a normal social way. They live in a reboot world. So while it, while it might make me angry if my game goes down the train and I lose, all I need to do is press a button and I am entirely at zero again. I can start at zero again. What kind of mindset is it for me? And if you think about neuroscience and neuroplasticity, so the brain adjusts, builds neurons, uh, and uh, synapses based on the experiences that you have continuously. Uh, by the way, that happens till old age. Um, so 
kind of, it's still, the plasticity is not as high, but it is still there. Um, now, you get this game world. You get constant connectivity. I'm amazed how little people are typing here. But the normality is fragmentation of attention. As a Harvard professor states, uh, our worst problem of this time is the fragmentation of our attention. Three minutes. I'm going to tell you this, this one thing, because that is, I think that's a very important thing. Unfortunately, I was teaching a leadership course in China, and I think three of the students wrote down this little story was the most important part of the course. And I thought, well, I might have a problem with my course, actually. <laughs> Anyhow, I call it the A7M rule. So there was a study done. Three groups, three representative groups, they had to do a one-hour intelligence test. One group <coughs> did not take drugs, was not interrupted, could concentrate for a full hour on the test. Let's call that the normal group. Normalized as 100%. The second group was interrupted every seven minutes. The third group had to smoke marijuana. <laughs> when I teach bachelor students, I usually say, I know which group you want to be in. Um, funny thing is, in China, they didn't know, they didn't know what marijuana was. <laughs> so it's a intercultural stuff. Anyhow, so if you take the first group as 100% performance level, second, every seven minutes interrupted, third group, smoke marijuana. What do you think of the group B and C perform to the normal group relative to that. Is my question clear? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that. What do you think, percentage-wise? <coughs> so, both 70%. So 70 and 70. Other guesses? 50 and 30. 50 and 30? Yeah. So if you are drugged, you are even worse. Yeah. I, had, I had people um, who said, oh, I'm the 30 for the marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> so I know where they were coming from. <laughs> Other guesses? Reality is 100%, every seven minutes interrupted, 30%. Marijuana, 70%. Mm -hmm. That's what we do if we type all the time in our meetings. That's what we do if we don't switch off social media, um, uh, phones, uh, emails, we've got these local <coughs> pop-ups. If you want to be effective, you have to isolate your mind. Now this fragmentation of attention, constant connectivity that is only starting now, a virtual reality empowered by something much, much stronger than what we have today, and that is pretty impressive, I think. <coughs> At least I was impressed. Um, artificial intelligence that already now can adapt to the questions. So the GMAT, who knows what the GMAT is? Okay, I have to explain this very quick. The GMAT is a standardized four-hour test, which a lot of universities, business schools use for MBA. So uh, as an entry exam, it's a four-hour test, two hours uh, quantitative and two hours uh, verbal. Um, to say. <laughs> 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 Where have been? Where did I start? We were talking about that in the concentration. <laughs> <laughs> closely correlated to the, to the skills you would need in an MBA program. And it adjusts to your, the way you answer the questions. So it's already a kind of virtual tutor. If we have one million times faster and stronger computers, how much more can we do with that? Constant con connectivity, fragmentation of attention, artificial intelligence of that level, that it can 
tutor individually online, virtual reality in that, in that format, will there be a campus? Will there be a need for a campus? What kind of teacher will we need to engage people? Will there still be human interaction? What level of robotic artificial intelligence interaction will there be? A lot of universities, a lot of universities built their business model, still have their business model built on having 300 bachelor students in one room and one lecturer in the front who is underpaid. <laughs> so that's, a, that's the business model. Um, this is sad. This is already an absurdity today. There is no reason why you should teach financial accounting to 300 people in a stone age didactic way. Learning psychology is telling us this since 100 years. Neuroscience <laughs> is telling us this since 20 years. This is the worst way of teaching anyhow. This way of teaching was invented when there were no books. Why the heck do we do this? This model will be dead. It will be wiped out. And that will substantially change how we work. Um, my guess is that we will move to a model where the individual interaction will be much more in a tutorial way, much more uh, in an interaction way, things you cannot learn in a virtual reality unless it's really up to a point that you, that you are fully in, in an avatar movie. Um, and that the whole, the entire rest will be codified. Everything that can be codified will be codified. It's a question of time. It's just a question of time. There is no reason why a student from Nigeria should come here, have the living costs of here, and listen with 300 others in a room to a financial accounting lecture. It's just an example. You can take many other lectures. It's something I, I know about, so I'm choosing this example. Um, let me see. One thing I want to point out is that is the Polity 4 scale. The Polity 4 scale was developed to measure um, political rights and political <coughs> equality. Every uh, sci uh, political scientist would kill me now because it's a, that's a rough definition. That's good enough. Um, I found that very astonishing how that explodes. And how that explodes the more the later we come, um, the closer we come to reality, to, 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 um, to today. And one of the backgrounds is globalization, and the other background is digitalization. Because the availability of information makes it much harder to isolate your people. Um, a lot of the um, uh, self-organization uh, of the um, protests during the Arabian Spring happened through applications on mobile phones. Very difficult to control. Yeah, you, do, you control one, they move to the next one. Even the internet, even with the resources of China, is hard to control. In Bo, Bo Xi Lei, uh, one of the runners up for the uh, presidentship was uh, then put into jail and sued. Um, still a discussion whether that was real or staged. Anyhow, um, once uh, the Chinese uh, uh, control um, uh, sensor, sensors uh, um, blocked the name, what did the online bloggers do? They invented a nickname. Once they blocked this nickname, they invented the next nickname. But there's a lot of creativity to work around this. And if you want to see what total isolation does, look at the uh, North, rather South Korea picture or travel to Cuba. I've lived in Cuba. Uh, I know very well what it's like. Um, it's not in entirely self-chosen isolation, but partially it is. So with with the digitalization, we've got much more knowledge diffusion, much faster knowledge diffusion. One of the effects is, not shown here, but important, that what I call the half value of knowledge goes down. So how long does an innovation pay off? This time is shortening. That can be shown statistically. That, for example, the time to market is in increasingly shortening. So 
How much time do I have as a car producer to bring a new model into the market? How much time do I have to bring a new, build a new platform for various cars, platform strategy, bring it into the market? How much time do I have with a truck in the market uh, to, leverage, um, uh, to leverage the invention? That's increasingly shortening. And one of the key reasons is the increasing knowledge diffusion and the speed of the knowledge diffusion. It's so easy to know um, what does a restaurant in Shanghai serve uh, tomorrow. I mean, we are so used to it, but at least I and I guess a number of the people in this room grew up in a world without GPS, without mobile phones and without internet. It's hard to imagine the way you're living. <laughs> so, <laughs> one quick word, a word about this. Um, you give me five minutes. Thank you. Um, we live in a massively indebted world. And between 2001 and 2013, this has increased by about 50 percentage points. Now, we are so used to that, having 1.4 trillion pounds in debts. And very often governments, I don't know whether they do that deliberately or whether it's just a mistake of politicians, they say the deficit is going down, so we don't have a problem. But if the deficit is going down, it means you are still adding to the absolute debt that you have. So it's still increasing. How are we going to pay that off? So if you... Um, have to refinance a house, that's good, because it's quite probable that interest rates will be kept very low, because the government, governments all around the world don't want that to increase. If you hold cash, that's not a good idea, because we will see inflation, because that is the usual way of governments to uh, reduce their debt. Um, <coughs> and this is the case in China, in Germany, in the US, in the Okay, the rising levels, but all on a problematic level. And the problem is, it's on the private side and on the government side, in extreme. And in that moment, 2008, we had the full explosion because we made a lot of debt to uh, get a hold on the crisis. This was, in principle, the right decision. The wrong decision was that we were in 2008 already at 190 percent. But there were very many good years in between. And when I'm in Germany, and I, I hear um, uh, yeah, it's, it's such a great success that we only have 1.5% uh, deficit this year, this year. Are you crazy? This is one of the strongest economies in the world. We are making 1.5% deficit in a great economical year with very low unemployment. When do we pay off, if not now? So with the, yesterday, not far from my hotel, was a protest against the austerity measures. I understand the emotion, but from an economic standpoint, that is an absurdity. Because we need to reduce this burden. And the key problem is, with the level of debt that we have now, nobody will be able to stop the next <coughs> avalanche. Nobody. Not Germany, not China, not the US the UK. We don't have any circuit breakers anymore. Next time, this is just going to tip over. And this is a large portion of why I say we are looking at an age, this climate change, a number of the other things we have looked at, we are looking at an age with a much higher volatility. Much higher volatility. So as companies, we need to, to build what Talib calls anti-fragile systems. Systems that can cope with crisis or get even stronger through crisis. He uses that visual of a muscle. If you shock a muscle by pumping iron, then the muscle grows. That, that's what he calls an anti-fragile system. A system that gets stronger with shock. You need to have buffers in your system need to have circuit breakers in your organization that limits spillovers. 
and we need to diversify our risk profile. So I don't think that's a secret. University of Liverpool has a very large Chinese student intake. Um, I would say, as a strategist, well, we have an urgent need to diversify that student body. So I would, it's not my decision, you know, but I would focus all my resources on building the Indian market, the Nigerian market, the Brazilian market, and even if, if in the beginning that doesn't pay off, once you build an alumni base, and that takes 10 years, then it starts paying off. Okay. What does this all mean for identity? Identity is a social construct. We develop our sense of self in interaction with others. In a digital age, what does it mean for my identity, for the feeling of identity? Second aspect of identity. One of the tasks of leadership is sense-making. Charles Handy, uh, one of the eminent management writers, calls this, calls this Work gives the three P's, the purpose, people, and pattern. Purpose, sense-making of the environment. Now the challenges we see in ever-increasing complexity of the environment, and the mental map has to match the, com the complexity of the mental map, has to match the complexity of the environment. It's, it can already be shown that, um, uh, that sea level managers have much more capability to interlink subjects than anybody else with any other qualification, including professors. Maybe not so. That will, they, this need will increase. Where do they come from? How do we educate them? We help them to see interrelated problems. Uh, Minzberg, another management scholar, writes so nicely, the problem with reality is you don't know which class you are in. So problems are interdisciplinary. They cut across the different fields within your own school, within, your, within business and economics, but they cut across, uh, across the different fields as this presentation cuts across the different fields. You have to embrace this. Do we educate in that way? We think in that way, do we think about strategy in that way? What kind of yeah. <coughs> what kind of adaptability do we build in our organization? Which kind of people do we need to hire so that we are ready to adapt? Do we hire people? who want to always stay the same, always do the same? Are we like that ourselves? And then quite probably, if you have a critical mass of that uh, attitude in the organization, the adaptability is low. Do we have structures that are highly centralized? Well, then the adaptability of the organization is quite probably pretty low. Most higher education institutions are relatively centralized. A high level of central centralization does not make for good knowledge processing. Because as an economist, you say, one of the principles of economic organization is you need an alignment of incentives, decision rights, measurement, and competence. Decision rights have to be where the competence is. If you have a highly centralized system that works in very static, low complexity environments, this time is gone. This is not the case anymore. We need more decentralized systems. We need what strategists call tight, loose couplings. So we need systems that are coupled together in a certain way to still realize economies of scale and have, for example, the same brand managed message to the outside. But at the same time, you need units that act individually, but in the way that you're in a central in the central strategy would want to, like a platoon that goes out in the field and has to take its decision by itself. <coughs> now, how do you do this? You do this by managing through culture, by building the same mindset, 
by teaching about the same approach, by a joint understanding of where we want to go, why we want to go there. And this is the last thing. Um, Charles Handy calls this the second curve. And the key message is we have to invent the next curve while we're still on the upswing. The Western world, our universities, and our economies are still doing pretty well. It's still growing. We have to invent the next curve now. And that means a different form of thinking, a different form of capitalism. We cannot continue to think in growth. The Club of Rome wrote that 72. That is still not in the mindsets. So imagine, imagine an aspiring prime minister or aspiring CEO saying, uh, I see for the, foresee for the next five years a steady state. Will he be voted for? Will the selection committee say, that's a great guy? We are, that is so deeply ingrained in us, but why do we have to grow? The, the strange thing is, we are richer than any generation before, and we are more indebted. Isn't that funny? Isn't that strange? It doesn't fill our need. We need a different form of thinking, and we need to reinvent ourselves, we need to reinvent our organizations, and we need to reinvent our societies. And with that, I would close. Sorry for being so long.